Good morning! Welcome to Woodlawn Without Walls Worship. I'm Pastor Lori. I'm so glad that you are joining us today. On behalf of Pastor Lance and myself, we want to welcome you to this service and let you know how glad we are that you're here. You can let us know that you're watching by clicking like if you're watching on Facebook or saying hello in the comments. Maybe greet those who are watching with you. Here at Woodlawn, we're committed to maintaining this online service for two reasons. First, we want worship to be available to those who are unable to attend in person for whatever reason. And second, we want to offer this service up as an invitation to those who might be interested in learning a little bit more about who we are here at Woodlawn as a community of faith and grace. If you fall into that second category, or if you're looking for more information, you can find all that on our website, woodlawnumc.net. Here at Woodlawn, one of the things that is in the very DNA of us here at Woodlawn is the focus on missions and ministry. Did you know that each Sunday, Woodlawn has a particular moment for mission that, de that giving is designated towards? If you want to know what this moment for mission is today or how you might be able to give, you can find that information on the website as well or subscribe to our newsletter. Call the church office to get added to that mailing list. As we come before God today, preparing our hearts for worship, we do so by joining together in our call to worship. I invite you to join me with reading the words that are on your screen. We praise the God of all nations and peoples, whose mercy extends to the ends of the earth, who are my brothers and sisters, all who walk in the way of Christ. We are many members, but one body.
On this World Communion Sunday, we come together in prayer. We come together lifting up our joys, our concerns, our sorrows, our worries, our fears, our celebrations, all lifting them up to God together in one voice. I will lift up a prayer, a pastoral prayer, sharing our, our prayer for World Communion Sunday and inviting other prayer concerns as well. We'll complete our time of prayer together by saying the Lord's Prayer. Would you please pray with me? Jesus prayed that we might be one, one in spirit, one in mission, in union and communion with each other and with you. Today, God, we confess fumblings and failures in accomplishing unity as we set aside yet another day to remind ourselves of the task. On this World Communion Sunday, give us eyes to recognize your reflection in the eyes of Christians everywhere. Give us a mind to accept and celebrate our differences. Give us a heart big enough to love your children everywhere. We thank you for setting a table with space enough for us all. And God, as we lift up our prayers to you, we pray for those who are sick, those who are dealing with, with new life changes, those who are seeking medical advice or waiting for answers or treatments. We pray for those who are in the hospital recovering from surgeries or procedures. We pray for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones, who are missing a person at their table. God, we know that you hear our prayer. And with one voice, we lift our prayer up to you, praying how you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today is World Communion Sunday. It's the day that we um, think about Christians who are gathering at the table of our Lord all around the world as we gather to eat and drink. And as I was thinking about and preparing for this message today, I couldn't help but reflect on the many, many times over the years that I have served the elements of the bread and the cup at the Lord's table. I remember the very first time that I ever served communion. It was as a lay person. I was serving alongside the pastor of the Hugoton United Methodist Church. I was given the bread and I was to hand each person a little piece of bread and say, the body of Christ. And as I did so, I, I, I remember thinking, as I said, the body of Christ. Was I referring to the little piece of bread, the morsel that I was handing to each person? Or as I said, the body of Christ. Was I referring to each person, a part of the body of Christ that was coming forward with their palms outstretched? Which is it? Maybe it's both. I remember serving communion for the first time as a pastor in my own church, the Tuskegee United Methodist Church, I had just returned from license to preach school, which is a two-week crash course to try to help those who are in their very first appointment learn just some of the practical nuts and bolts of, of doing a worship service, doing a wedding, doing a funeral, serving communion, and so forth. And I remember uh, being very, very nervous walking up to that little plain table at the front of the Tuskegee United Methodist Church. And as I um, began to go through the communion liturgy, I wondered, am I, am I holding up the bread at the right moment? Am I holding up the cup at the right moment? Am I saying all of the right words that we had been taught? Was I saying the right prayers? And, and I remember wondering if, if I messed up, 
Then were the little pieces of bread still the body of Christ? If I messed up, were the little cups of Welch's juice still the blood of Christ? I was a nervous wreck. And as the first person walked forward to receive Holy Communion, I, I remember to this day, her name was May. She was an elderly retired school teacher from the community. Um, very soft-spoken, very kind. And I remember as she walked forward and I, I kind of stumbled out with the body of Christ given for you. And I remember her hand, she touched the top of my hand and cupped it and held it for just a moment. I said, the, the body of Christ, I stammered. And she looked at me in the eye and she said, yes, yes. And all my fear and my trepidation melted away. You know, over the years, I've uh, served Holy Communion to those who received it for the very last time. Some of them I served in their bed, their sick bed, their deathbed before they passed away. At other times, I served them at the altar when neither one of us knew that it would be the last time that they would feast at the Lord's table here on this earth, that the next time they would feast in Jesus's presence. Over the years, I've also served communion to many little tykes for the very first time. When a child comes forward for communion, I like to change it up a little bit. I, I usually don't say this is the body of Christ for you or this is the blood of Christ given for you. I, I like to just say, Jesus loves you. Mm. I mean, after all, I think that's the basic message, isn't it? Jesus loves you. I've served communion to kids in swimsuits at camp. I've served communion to men in an addiction treatment facility. I've served communion in a homeless shelter. I've served communion to people in cars in a drive-by service. I served communion with whatever we could get our hands on that resembled bread and juice. And for more than a year, Christy and I served communion to each other in our home, as many of you did, part of the dispersed body of Christ that was prevented from gathering together in person. I served communion when I felt I wasn't worthy of serving it. And I have received communion when I was certain that I was not worthy of receiving it. The Apostle Paul addresses this issue of worthiness as it relates to Holy Communion. I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 11, beginning at the 23rd verse. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment against themselves. Now these are the words of the Apostle Paul. And Paul seems to suggest that there may be some who are unworthy of receiving the bread and the cup. He says, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, some churches use that passage to suggest that a person must be a member in good standing of their church in order to come to the Lord's table. That in order to be worthy of taking Holy Communion, one must confess their sin and adequately repent of that sin 
and that they also must be full participants in the body of Christ. That is, they must have regular attendance at the services of worship and they must participate in the contributions or offerings to the church. And when people are not in good standing, they are excommunicata, excommunicated. That's where we get that phrase, meaning they cannot take communion at the table. Now, if you read closely Paul's words in this passage, I don't think what he is suggesting as worthiness has anything to do with any of those things. He, he, he's not talking about religious practices. He doesn't, he doesn't say that you must be of the right denomination or you might you must attend the right church or that you have to have a good attendance record or a record of offerings. It's, it's not religious practice that makes one worthy to receive the bread and the cup. I mean, after all, Jesus is the one who said in the Gospel of Matthew, this is the blood of the new covenant that is given for many for the forgiveness of sins. Hear it? So if the cup is for the forgiveness of sins, why would one have to be in a forgiven state in order to receive it? No, no, the elements themselves, the very, the very bread and the cup, the body and the blood of Jesus are the means of grace that forgive us of our sins. So what is Paul talking about when he gets us all riled up about who's worthy and who's not worthy to receive the elements of Holy Communion? I, th I think he gives us a clue in the next couple of sentences that he writes. He says we should examine ourselves before we eat and drink. And then he says, for all who eat and drink without discerning the body, eat and drink judgment against themselves. Without discerning the body. Now, some translations clarify this statement, adding the words of the Lord so that it reads, so any who eat and drink without discerning the body of the Lord, eat and drink judgment against themselves. Discerning the body of the Lord. Paul says that's what he means about who's worthy. Are, are we discerning the body of the Lord? Well, there. We have it. We know what Paul's talking about, right? <laughs> Hardly. Um, goodness sakes. If there ever was a phrase in Scripture that needs unpacking, this is probably it. Discerning the body of the Lord. What does Paul mean by that? Well, Bible scholars primarily suggest there's two interpretations for this phrase. And both can be true at the same time. Now, the first interpretation is about the symbolic nature of the bread and the cup being the very body and blood of Jesus. And this makes these elements, bread and juice, different from all other food. And this understanding of discerning the body, discerning that this bread and this cup really are the body and the blood of Jesus, this fits with Paul's instructions. Uh, to the people in Corinth and their behavior coming to the Lord's table. He's already chastised them for treating the Lord's table as a lavish buffet and eating and drinking to excess. This isn't about filling up your belly, he in essence is telling them. This food is different. It's special. It is the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus. And in fact, in verse 26, remember, Paul writes that partaking in the bread and cup is a proclaiming the death of Jesus. So to treat these elements as just common food, just bread and, and wine, uh, is mocking the sacrifice that Christ has made for us. And Paul takes that seriously, and he believes that God takes that very seriously as well. But there's another interpretation that could be just as true. Discerning the body could also refer uh, to more than just the elements of the meal. Some scholars believe that Paul was acknowledging the relationship between the body of Christ, the actual body and form of Jesus' body, and the body of Christ, that is, the church, the body of believers. To discern the body is to discern who is a part of the body of Christ. This view also fits very well in with Paul's other writings. He, he wrote just a few verses earlier in chapter 10 of this same letter, these words. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? And the bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? 
Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So, to discern the body then is to recognize and honor other Christians. Just as the bread and the cup are different from other foods, so the body of Christ as a gathered body of believers, we recognize we are set apart. We're different from the rest of the world. How do we discern the body of the Lord? I admit I, I don't do that well because I get caught up in the way the world blurs and overcategorizes and objectifies one another, you know how we separate and classify and judge the body by denomination, who's Baptist, who's Lutheran, who's Methodist, who's non-denominational, or by uh, larger classifications, who's evangelical, who's mainline, who's Protestant, who's Catholic, or by ideology, who's fundamental, who's traditional, who's progressive, even by race, the black church, the white church, the Korean church or Asian church, by geography, the southern, the northern, the eastern orthodox, the Roman Catholic. Hear, hear all the, the subjective labels that we place on the body of Christ to divide the body of Christ up. Of course, there's the possibility that Jesus discerns a body that is even larger than the one that we recognize. I mean, after all, he himself was always widening his circle to include Gentiles, Samaritans, Romans, sinners. Could it be that discerning the body is Paul's way of telling us that we shouldn't be limiting who is and is not, who can and can be, a part of the body of Christ. What if Paul is arguing for the exact opposite of judging who is worthy to receive the Lord's Supper by their religious practices, instead saying that, you know, Jesus would welcome anyone at the table, that the only thing that might make us unworthy, that might invite judgment, is to limit by not discerning the body of Christ appropriately, to limit who is part of the body of Christ, who is a child of God. See, I think this idea fits well with another of Paul's great passages. You remember when he wrote in Galatians 3, For in Christ Jesus you are all children of God in faith. There is no longer then Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male or female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus our Lord. <laughs> it seems that Paul was also pretty inclusive when it came to discerning the body. We often refer to people with labels as a way of discerning who should be separated and excluded, Democrat, Republican, for example. How important are, th are those labels in the upcoming election season, right? Or, or labels like refugees and immigrants. These have been ways of discerning who might be a threat rather than describing people in need. We talk about prisoners and criminals and the homeless and illegals instead of people who are incarcerated or people who have been convicted by a jury or people without housing or people without documents. Hmm? How might we discern the body? All of God's children who belong to Christ rather than labeling to describe the parts of how we are different. Steve Gardner uh, is a pastor and, and attorney and he writes about the concept that he learned from a common African Zulu greeting. Sawabona, Sawabona. Its literal meaning is, I see you. And it's both a literal indication that you're in my vision, you're in my eyesight, but it's also a metaphorical indication that you're on my mind, that you are valued. By calling out Sawabona, 
one indicates they have discerned, they've honored, they have recognized a fellow tribe member. Mm -hmm. Gardner suggests that this is the kind of discerning and honoring and recognizing that we should do with others who are part of the body of Christ. Sawabona. Sawabona. I see you. Not as Jew or Greek or Asian or African or Baptist or Methodist or male or female or even transgendered or non-gendered, uh, slave or free, imprisoned or employed. No, no, no. I simply see you as one who is a part of the body of Christ. Whether you recognize that yet or not yourself makes no difference. I see you as a part of the body of Christ. I discern you as part of the body. We are worthy of the bread and the cup together. One body, one Lord of all. Thanks be to God. You know, today I want to once again uh, include the invitation that we make on our communion Sundays. If you're at home and unable to be with us in person, but would like to partake of the body and the blood of Jesus as a means of grace, please call our church and either Pastor Lori or myself will come and be happy to serve you Holy Communion in your home. God's blessings this week.